Right, good afternoon everybody. Um, we're going to get started. So a warm welcome to our web presentation to unveil the findings of our construction and property salary and recruiting trends survey. Um, thanks very much for giving up uh, probably your lunch times. We'll be between 30 and 45 minutes. Um, of your valuable time. And I'm glad instead of hitting the uh, internet to see the published legal advice for Brexit, you've chosen to uh, dial into us. So thank you very much. So my name is Duncan Bullimore from Hayes. Uh, sitting beside me is my colleague Richard Gelder. Good afternoon. And by way of a very brief intro, um, I've worked for Hayes for the last 25 years, primarily on the construction side of our business, and Richard for 27 years on uh, the property side of the business. Now, we're going to take you through the findings of our survey, and then after which we'll take a few questions, time permitting. So to post a question at any time, you can see the chat function on your screen, um, and you can simply post your question there. Now, this is the fifth year that we've produced a UK-wide um, survey. It covers 12 specialist skilled and technical areas, and it's supported by regional data for uh, a range of different roles. It's based on salary information um, derived from 1,800 Hayes consultants uh, from across our network of 93 offices. Now, aside from this um, extensive insight which we put into the guide, we also launched an external survey to measure employee satisfaction and employers' concerns and to gather further insight. Um, this generated 23,000 uh, responses, which is brilliant, um, and over 2,500 of these came from construction and property professionals. To start then, let's set the scene quickly by recapping on the headline findings from last year. So this is for UK all sectors, um, and in 2017 for the year ahead, 59% um, of organisations expected their business activities to increase, 71% said they were planning to recruit, uh, the average salary increase uh, for, for that year was 1.8%, and just over half of employees said they were considering a move uh, uh, you know, from job to job in the coming 12 months. Now, just before we move into the findings, um, I want to caveat proceedings with a seasonal sprinkling of the Brexit word. Now, whilst we know that this is the elephant in the room, um, and it does have the potential to start misbehaving, right now, the elephant in the room is behaving quite calmly. Um, we acknowledge that our findings were collected um, earlier this year, um, which in Brexit days is obviously quite a long time, but the fact of the matter is that at Hayes we've seen no material changes to the real job volumes. Now, if you've, uh, if you've seen any of the articles in the press over the last 24 hours around the construction industry, um, I think there's quite a bit of positivity that um, is, is, is right to reference. I'm just looking in the, the Times uh, note, the Telegraph from today, um, the Purchasing Managers Index Survey, uh, here's some of the quotes, construction industry increased output to a four month high in November. Um, that's eight consecutive months of growth. Um, growth has been led by housing, but the commercial and civil sectors have increased, increased too. And the number of people employed in the industry grew at the fastest rate since December 15. So I think it's all part of a positive backdrop despite Brexit. Now, I've discovered a new acronym this week for those who are bored of Brexit. Um, and those people are called BOBS. So for all the bobs out there, um, we're going to be sparing with the B word today, but uh, I'm sure a few will sneak in. Now, one of the questions we're going to be exploring today is, are we in the most competitive construction and property employment market of recent times? 
and we're going to take a look at what our survey results show in more detail. Now, just to say, uh, construction and property, we're going to abbreviate to CMP throughout, uh, just to save everybody's time. So let's start with a positive. And although there's obvious uncertainty out there, ongoing uncertainty, employers' business outlook remains robust and employers are optimistic about the market and their businesses. So reflecting on the last couple of years and then coming up to date, C&P &P employers predict an increase to business activity levels compared to prior year. And looking back to 2016, 72% of employers forecast an increase in business activity levels. Uh, then post-referendum, that dropped to 58%. Uh, which we did actually survey at the time, then it grew to 63% last year and 66% um, expecting an increase in activity levels um, in the year ahead. So a good rebound in confidence uh, since the referendum. Now, more or less on par with last year shows that only 4% of CMP employers expected a decrease in activity. So I think this is good news um, and shows if the, cup, uh, if the cup is half full, that 96% of employers are optimistic about business activity. And the optimism s suggests that organizations remain focused on the opportunities ahead rather than worrying about uh, the wider uncertainty. And CMP employers are also marginally more optimistic than the UK all sector average. So the 66% uh, you can see there compares with 61%, which you can't see on the screen there, um, in the wider economy. So what does this level of confidence mean for hiring? So the UK all sector um, figure is 76% expect uh, to be recruiting staff over the next 12 months. And look at it on a um, in graphical format. There, you can see this is the highest percentage that we have recorded in five years of doing this report, and is actually a reversal uh, following two years of decline. When looking at the recruitment plans for CMP employers um, in isolation, this figure is even higher than the national average, coming in at 78% of employers planning to recruit staff over the next year. And it's also an increase from 74% from the uh, CMP figure from uh, a, the year before. Now, in terms of identifying the type of recruitment uh, that is planned, um, in terms of uh, permanent recruitment, this has increased by three percentage points compared to last year, and for temporary uh, assignments, temporary recruitment, by five percent uh, uh, percentage points compared to last year. But clearly, some employers could be engaged in both hiring markets. Now, at Hayes, we are seeing a good balance also in permanent and temporary hiring. Um, and in the, uh, in, in the months we're in right now, there is a better balance than there has been for several quarters. Over to you, Richard. Right. OK, thanks, Duncan, and good afternoon, everyone. So overall, a positive picture for the sector, highlighted in terms of current expectations albeit with the caveats Duncan highlighted around the current position regards Brexit. However, there are significant challenges within the market, particularly around competition for skills and talent, and I'll now go on to explore our survey findings in this area. So let's start with an overview to what CMP employers are recruiting or need in terms of skills. So as you can see, unsurprisingly, the biggest area of demand is for operational and technical staff. And that's almost two-thirds of employees looking for skills in those core areas. However, it's not just operational roles in demand. And as you can see, the second highest area is for leadership and managerial staff. 40% of employees looking for skills here. So that's absolutely the highlight that it's just not operational roles in demand. It's also leadership teams too. And finally, as you can see, there is also demand for non-CMP roles. So 
IT, finance, admin, etc. And whilst we don't cover this in this presentation, it does show for many recruitment stretches beyond the core CMP disciplines. Right, so let's start to look at the headlines. And first, it is that 94% of CMP employers say they experienced skills shortages in the last year. As with some of the early percentages that Duncan covered, this is ahead of the total UK average, which is 92%. Now, that's obviously not a new headline. Skill shortages have been a constant theme of recent years, but as you can see from this slide, there has been a material impact around hiring as a result. For permanent hiring, three quarters of CMP employers had difficulty due to skill shortages, and two thirds had difficulty when it came to temporary or freelance staff. So really significant numbers uh, absolutely highlight the challenge facing employees in the sector. We've also um, seen a change this year in the number of CMP employers who have concern around competition from other employers when recruiting. So this is up to almost 50% as you can see. So this is certainly consistent what we've seen in recent months in terms of there being a general trend that there are less candidates proactively looking for a new role and the, and the definition is important here, and by proactively, I mean that the candidate has taken the actual decision to change employers, as opposed to merely considering, uh, merely considering a move if the right thing comes up. One of the other key elements here could also be the reduction in the numbers of EU workers in the UK. So this has been widely reported in recent months by a number of the professional institutes and main journals. So in an already skill short market, this loss of talent has been an extra element in creating pressure, which in turn is feeding into increased competition. Looking ahead, this trend looks set to continue. So, as you can see here, almost 70% of employers highlight that a lack of suitable applicants will be their top recruitment challenge. And I'll speculate um, this is likely to be a worsening position in the short term, particularly if employees hunker down over the next few months until the picture around Brexit becomes clearer. So regardless of the future, the impact of skill shortages to date is highlighted by the second statistic on the screen, and that's almost a quarter of employers that don't have the talent in their organisations to meet business objectives. So clearly a major issue that's held organisations back in 2018. Another aspect of skill shortages is the impact to employee morale and wider workplace productivity. And as you can see from the slide here, over a third of CMP employers reported that skill shortages have had a negative impact on employee morale. And as you can see from this slide, the percentage of employers in the, in the CMP sector that reported, that reported skills shortages affecting productivity now stands at over half, at 56%. So just to give you a comparison, the UK figure is 49%, so once again, We've got another statistic here that highlights the CMP sector is in a worse position than the rest of UK PLC. In addition, the detail on the right of the slide highlights some of the specific impacts as a result of shortages, project delivery, growth plans, customer services, all areas highlighted in the survey. Right, so we'll now move on to look at the salary detail. So Duncan, back to you. Okay, back to me. Um, an inevitable reaction in the market to the skills gap is a further increase in the price of labour um, per se and the pressure on employers to boost salaries, so salaries rising to address the skills gap. Now we report each year of the percentage of employers who intend to increase salaries uh, that they pay to employees and in the past year CMP employers increased salaries at a greater rate than they had predicted to. So 70% increased salaries in the last 12 months, which is greater than the 66% who expected to when asked last year. But this is slightly lower than the national all-sector average. Now, time for a drum roll for the big number with the top billing. So the average construction and property salary increase over the last 12 months has been 2.7%. Now along with legal 
uh, which is another uh, of the 12 industry sectors and functional areas that Hayes has surveyed in its main, um, uh, its, its main research, this is joint highest. So construction property has the joint highest increase of any of the sectors in our guide. Now the overall increase in salaries across the UK all sectors is far less than this at 1.9%, but in all areas of increased skill shortage, pay rises have been higher. So it is correct to say numerically that uh, the 2.7 versus the 1.9 um, is almost 50% higher. So I think this is significant. Now we're gonna take a quick look at the regional picture across 10 UK regions. Now this shows a good balance across the country um, and I think does bear out that the prosperity of the built environment has radiated a long way from London and the South East, which is often um, perhaps not commentated uh, the case, but I think this does bear it out. Um, and London and the South East are being placed mid-pack rather than stretching away at the top as they have in previous years. Now at Hayes this is also borne out in the activity levels that we see in these regions, um, which I don't think is a coincidence. Now we're now going to look through um, a series of slides quite quickly, which report on the whole the top three salary increases by job title across nine functional areas. Um, I'm not going to dwell too long on each slide, but there will be uh, a couple of comments uh, along the way. So firstly, to the men and women who are getting the projects built, the construction teams, and we're seeing some of the highest salary increases in our survey, with 5% being for the commercial managers. Now on to those who are keeping us all safe. This is the health and safety group, and it is the CDM coordinators uh, and principal designers that have come out on top at 4.6%. Over to the team in the architecture group, the design, performance, and aesthetics uh, people. Uh, and it's the senior technologists that are out in front at 3.8%. For those out there gaining and giving the right permission, permissions for, uh, for construction, it's the planning group, um, which is looking at both local government and consultancy organizations. Uh, we can see the planners there at 4.6% increase, um, but this is a very skill short area. Now over to those that are making the projects and schemes stand the test of time. It's the um, civil and structural engineering category, and it is the civil engineers at the top of the uh, salary increases there at 2.5%. So making our buildings work for us during their life cycle, it's the uh, facilities management group and it's the mechanical and electrical engineer um, uh, job category that is on top at 4.1%. Making our environments perform for ourselves, it's the building services group with the contract QSs on top at 4.1%. And then over to the surveying consultants, which is uh, those involved in construction schemes. So it's project management, professional QSing, cost consultants, etc. cetera. Um, and the most notable one there is the newly qualified, um, qualified surveyors, uh, which is interesting. And then over to the, um, the general practice surveyors. So uh, aligned to uh, asset management, valuation, disposal, and acquisition. And again, it's the newly qualified surveyors. So there's real competition down to entry level, um, but closely followed by uh, those um, following chartership. Back over to you, Richard. Lovely, thank you, Duncan. Right, so as you have seen, pay rises have been reasonably high across the board. I think in some cases actually very high. So now, now let's move on to the final part of our survey findings, which is around salaries. So to begin with, um, and given what we've seen in relation to salaries, this is perhaps unsurprising, 
that there has been a higher level of salary satisfaction among CMP employees this year. As you can see here, 64% of employees say they're happy with their salaries, and this was in comparison to 45% last year. There has been a drop also in the number of requests, the number of re requests for pay rises. Uh, only 31% of employees asked for a pay rise in the past 12 months, and that was compared to 35% the year before. And I suppose given we've now had three to four years of above inflation pay rises in many parts of the CMP sector, it's perhaps expected that this drop should have happened. However, of those employees that did move roles in the last quarter, salary was still was still the main reason for a sizable majority sizable minority for that change, and that was just over a quarter at twenty eight percent. And among those who did not currently intend to move jobs in the year ahead, almost half at 44% admitted a better salary would still tempt them to consider changing jobs. And I think this certainly highlights that although our findings indicate that salaries are becoming, a bit of a, are becoming less of a hot topic for employees, it does show that it remains the main issue when considering a new position. And finally, the last insight around salaries, and this is the mismatch between employee expectations around pay transparency <coughs> excuse me, and what employees feel they see from their employer. So I think this is contexted by the fact that wage transparency has now started to become much of a norm, and this will be a really interesting area to keep an eye on. I suppose the question here is whether this could be a pitfall in the future for employers that don't offer transparency. Will they be seen as less attractive places to work? Time will tap. So the final area of our report we'll reflect on is the area of non-salary elements that make up the offer or the proposition to an employee. <coughs> and as you can see from the slide here, salary aside, there are three other main elements that influence a person to whether they stay with an employer or look to move. The reports we produced earlier in the year, and the, there was two of them, one is the What Workers Want report as well as the more recently published Hayes Diversity and Inclusion Report have got a really detailed breakdown in terms of insights around these areas, and they're absolutely excellent companion pieces to this salary survey. But there are a couple of areas which feature in this uh, salary survey which I'll touch on now. So firstly, we've established that salary is one of the most important factors of the four, if not the most important. But as you can see here, career progression is important too. And 20% of employees highlight that career progression will be a main motivator about moving roles in the coming year ahead. However, our findings showed the number of employees who felt uncertain in their career prospects rose slightly from last year to 47%, relatively small change. And in some respects, this is actually at odds with the headline that Duncan shared, or the headlines that Duncan shared earlier in terms of the strength of current workloads and positive hiring plans. But this percentage certainly reflects there is no room for complacency. If this area isn't addressed, it will be a major factor for some employees looking for new roles. The other big area of influence for employees is that of work-life balance. And as you can see here, the number of CMP employees rating their work-life balance as poor to average is at 51%, just over half. So this is unchanged from last year, and I suppose depending on your perspective, that can be positive or negative. But either way, work-life balance remains a huge issue for our sector. And this is an area which has really evolved in importance in recent years. But as you can see from the graph here, there's still work to do. So what we're looking at here is there's a quarter of our employees prioritizing work-life balance when they consider a new role. But as you'll see, this is not necessarily matched by employers as yet. But as I say, it's something that has grown rapidly in importance uh, in recent years. There's a gap that needs closing, and I think this is particularly for those employers who are struggling to attract talent or retain talent by competing on salary alone. Good. So thank you for your time so far. And that concludes the tour of some of the main headlines, some of the key detail from the report. So I'm just going to take a couple of moments now, and I'm going to summarize and recap the key findings first, and then I'm going to move on to outline um, quite quickly some recommendations for actions over the next two slides. We'll then open up for any questions you may have. So let's start with a summary of our key findings. Firstly, we have seen that despite the wider uncertainty caused by the ongoing Brexit negotiations, employer confidence in activity for the year ahead remains positive at the current time, 
definitely reinforced by the news today, and it's still very much business as usual at the moment. Secondly, as a result, recruitment remains a top priority for most organisations, and demand has reached the highest level in recent years. Thirdly, continued skill shortages, however, exacerbated by potential, by potential reducing labour pool in places, has increased competition for talent further. Fourthly, salaries remain on the rise and continue to be a key part of the attraction ratio. However, salary is not the only factor, and increasingly other elements such as career progression and work-life balance are key factors. And finally, whilst it's harder now to attract new staff, many potential employees do remain open to options, but it has to be a rounded offer, including elements over and above salary, such as work-life balance and, cl and clear career prospects. So finally, let me conclude by looking at our recommendations as we head towards 2019. So five recommendations here. Firstly, ensure your overall reward strategy is competitive. So clearly getting the right strategy is critical as we've highlighted. And pay benchmarking and annual salary reviews are key actions to ensure you are getting your financial package right. However, it is just one aspect of the picture and it's critical to make sure the other elements are appropriate and meet evolving expectations. Flexible working holidays have really grown in importance in recent years. They're now seen as key elements. For many people, they're on a level with salary in terms of priority. So make sure you review these elements too. Are they up to date and in line with the market? Next, improve or develop your employer value proposition and brand. So this should include elements around pay and benefits, but also your culture the career opportunities and the scope for personal development of employees or potential employees. A strong EVP will help retain potential employees as well as being a key attraction tool. Hold a mirror to yourself. What is your working environment and reputation? Start to understand your authentic culture. By developing and sharing your story, and this will include testimonials from your existing staff around these elements, will be key in both recruitment and retention. Next. Engage candidates from the widest possible pool. So we all know as often as not, recruitment needs are very specific and do require individuals with established qualifications, skill sets and experience. However, many roles don't. And being flexible to hire on potential or on transferable skills is now an increasingly explored option. What roles do you have that can be looked at differently? Also, are you now maximizing modern, modern apprenticeships, which has been a key change in the last year or two? Can you develop talent from outside the traditional pool of graduates by exploring this route? Fourth, maximize your diversity and inclusion strategies. There's a huge amount of work going on in the sector around DNI, and much of it is led by collaborative work from networking groups and the professional institutes. There is lots of free advice and expertise to tap into, and all of this is really aimed at retaining, attracting, and maximizing talent, but also opening up talent pools which are a key solution in tackling the industry skill shortages. And fifth and finally, improve your candidate experience to avoid losing talent when recruiting. So in very simple terms, make sure the hard work you put in attracting talent isn't wasted by poor processes or a negative experience during the journey. So, so in very simple terms, test the applicant process yourself. Is it an efficient and positive experience? How does it feel as a user? Finally, if you are making job offers, be precise around those offers, both verbal and written. And speed remains key in a competitive market, so don't fall over at the last hurdle. Right, so that concludes our presentation, and I really hope you found that insightful. We've rushed through a lot of the detail there. So what we are now going to do is we're going to open the floor up to any questions in the next few minutes. So Duncan, do we have any questions so far? Uh, yes, we've got um, yeah, we've got a few coming through already. Uh, let's have a quick look. So we seem to, we seem to be getting quite a few questions uh, around salary increase in uh, specific disciplines and functional areas, which I guess was um, expected. So let, let's just share some of our thoughts around some of these. So when it comes to construction, the construction group, um, as I mentioned, had some of the highest salary increases, um, which I don't think is entirely, uh, I'm entirely surprised by, because 
there's hard, high volume of projects that are at the build stage. So many of these jobs will have started, you know, maybe even 18 months, two years ago, uh, or the ones that have started in the current year. So there's a hell of a lot that is on site, um, and uh, employers are competing quite uh, vigorous, vigorously for, for the skills to deliver them. So uh, I think that one was fairly um, fairly obvious for me. Yeah, what about I, you also? Well, well, I think a couple I would pick up on. I think um, planning, and, and you referenced that's quite a skills short market, but there was a big change um, um, in uh, in 2017 with, um, with employment legislation around self-employed status within the public sector. And, and what that really resulted in with the planning was was a real change from people working on a on a freelance basis um, to more of a permanent basis. So I think that's part of the headline there, um, and that's definitely driven driven the perm thing. Um, interesting one for me. We've seen a bit of a pattern with some of the technologists and the technician roles, um, certainly within architecture. I think also within building services, and I reflect that that some of that is is the continued march of BIM, um, and particularly. Um, you know, those with Revit um, are still very much in demand. Again, not a new headline, but, um, but that's definitely something. And I think the final one for me is just picking up on some of those um, some of those comments you made around the surveying sector and, you know, that real competition for skills. And I think that reflects um, the, the – I think there is a pipeline and there are people coming into the sector. It's still perhaps not as much as the sector needs right now. And I think that's feeding through to those graduates and, and, and postgraduate ones. So certainly a couple of highlights I, I will have a comment on that. Um, just a quick answer. A few people are saying how do, how do they get to participate in the survey in, in coming years. The survey um, is generally produced from February. Um, and goes out in email format to um, to uh, you know our, our contacts and candidates on our database and comes out through social media. So um, that certainly happens. Um, I've got another one here. So we've had this from two or three people. Um, so uh, the 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 the, 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 the uh, drive of the question is is do uh, what's your thoughts about salaries increasing next year or do you expect salaries to increase next year? So I think I think um, we don't have a crystal ball, and, and I suppose that that's that's the first and obvious point. And all those caveats about you know what's happening in the world at the moment, you know, read the uh, you know read the sort of situation around Brexit. But but right now it's very hard to conclude anything different than what we've seen over the last three or four years. And we've seen um, CMP running at um, um, above inflation pay rises in a lot of areas, and particularly given the skill shortages. You know, remains our key issue, and that doesn't seem to be changing at all. And I certainly don't anticipate that changing in 2019. And indeed, in some places, may even get worse, um, subject to what happens with uh, you know with some of our professional colleagues from the EU. I, I would expect at the moment, or I would guess at the moment, very much a similar pattern in this year uh, for next year that we've seen to this year. Um, <clears throat> we've had a couple of questions in. Um, Suggesting that the, uh, the 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 roles mentioned are perhaps not granular enough for the the, the you know the, the level of you know to benchmark against the level of uh, employees that that they have. So um, I think I would just encourage you to uh, contact Hayes in your local area, where you'd be able to speak to one of our specialist recruiters who can give you much more granular advice uh, uh, around salaries within um, a local area. Yeah, uh, well, well, to to that? yeah well, well, I think just to add to it as well is, is do have a look at the detail within the actual guide itself. And please bear in mind that we've, we've, we've cherry-picked um, a few of, the, uh, few of the headline salaries just for the presentation today. But in each of the functional areas that we reported on, um, we roughly cover about um, 15 to 25 um, individual roles in each. So in total, we do actually cover off the best part of two, three hundred individual roles across the CMP sector. So again, please look within the um, within the salary survey for more granular detail, which um, I hope will uh, will provide the, the answers you need. Um, 
<clears throat> Richard, there's a question that's come to you there that might be easier for you to answer. Yeah, so we've got a question here saying, is there a significant difference between salary increases between public and private sector? And I, and I would say, in general, there is, and I would say that the private sector is paying more. And I think um, it's been a really interesting 12 months because um, certainly from a, a recruitment perspective, the public sector has been much more active as there's been a real increase um, um, in, in the property side of the public sector estates and using those assets as part of a commercial drive to um, increase revenues or, um, or try and balance off perhaps some potential cuts that are being faced at a local level, using the assets better. So the big thing I think we've seen from public sector, I think this does reflect with some of the findings we've reported on today is that they perhaps know they can't compete on salary, so what they compete harder on is other areas, work-life balance in particular, and I think they can compete very well on pension. So I think what that does reflect is that you don't necessarily have to be paying the best to attract staff, and it's using those different elements of that proposition which are outlined um, in that context. Um, we've got a question here verbatim is, do you find it difficult to source suitably qualified commercial staff within the industry at present? Um, the answer to that would be there is, there is a constant uh, flow of um, staff looking to, you know, looking to move jobs, but there is certainly a significant mismatch between supply and demand uh, uh, you know, within housing development or contracting organisations. Um, so, sadly, uh, I, I don't have a silver bullet there other than um, taking some of the advice of the, the survey around all of the other elements that you can offer as an employer aside from just the salary, um, maybe a bigger draw on, uh, on, on candidates. Um, another question here, um, uh, are we going to share the slides from, from the survey today? So, so yes we are, and, and they, will be, um, they will be on YouTube, I think, um, in, the next, in the next week or so. So um, you'll be able to listen to the commentary, um, which I hope, um, I hope will be uh, as entertaining second time around as first time around, um, and you'll be able to see the slides. And, and again, I think George is referencing on, on one of Duncan's points, um, if anyone needs a deeper dive, please reach out to us at a local level, and we'll, um, you know, and we'll have those conversations with you as required at a local level. I think we've, uh, I think we've dealt with that. So um, we really do appreciate you taking the time to dial in. As I say, us competing with, uh, uh, with, with Parliament today. But for all you bobs out there, the Brexit count was four to Richard, two to Duncan. Um, so have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Bye-bye.